Welcome to Things We Said Today, the weekly podcast about all things Beatles, past, present, and if we happen to know about something coming up in the future, we'll talk about it. Uh, I'm Alan Cozen, and I'm joined by Ken Michaels, who you may also know as the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everybody. <laughs> And Steve Marinucci, who you know as the Beatles Examiner, the writer of the Beatles Examiner column and many other Examiner columns. And uh, hello, Steve. How are you doing? Hi, Alan. Hello, everyone. And Al Sussman, a longtime contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine and now executive editor of Beatles Mag- Beatle Fan Magazine. Hello, Al. Hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. So we have a lot to discuss this week because our main topic is the Beatles 1 and Beatles 1 Plus. But we should also begin um, by recognizing the uh, pa- the passing of Andy White, who, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, played drums on the September 11th, 1962 session at which the second version of Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You, and an early version of Please Please Me were recorded, uh, and so has a sort of important place in Beatles history. And he died on Monday at his home in Caldwell, New Jersey. I found out, uh, I, was, I wrote his obituary for the New York Times and was asking his wife about some of the other things that he worked on, and um, a lot of the obits mentioned... Uh, Tom Jones, it's not unusual, and some other things. But what I didn't know was that he also played drums on "I'm Henry the Eighth, I Am," the Herman's Hermit song, which of course begins with drums. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, he did a lot of work. Uh, he toured with Marlene yeah, I, Dietrich I, and I heard, Steve. I heard that he had done Herman. I'd heard that he'd done Herman's Hermits. I can't remember whether I'd heard it was that song, but um, in researching what I wrote up. The name Herman's Hermits did come uh, across. So, yeah. And in a way, it's a pity Tom Frangioni, our sometimes co-host, is not with us because he knew him. And uh, there is video on YouTube of him introducing a performance of Love Me Do with the Smithereens playing and Andy White on drums. And Andy White's last mm-hmm. recording was P.S. I Love You with the Smithereens. Um, and for historical verisimilitude, Dennis Dykin, the Smithereens drummer, stood aside and played maracas while Andy White played <laughs> drums. So, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice of him. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyone have any observations about Andy White before we move on to one? Well, I was going to say, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's funny how when people are putting stuff together, there are all sorts of labels. And I actually saw a fifth Beatle label um, oh, put, yeah. put, on Andy, on the put on Andy morning. White yesterday. And, and uh, mm-hmm. I kind of, you know, went, mm, yeah, well, yeah. anyway, but uh, but yeah. uh, it's sad that he got so much recognition after his passing, you know, and, and not before and, and the whole the whole thing, the whole, you know, situation. What was funny was when I was doing the research, I was looking up, you know, the, uh, the whole, the recording session and how much Ringo was really upset about that. And, um, and somebody made the comment, uh, I think on my Facebook page yesterday, I wonder if Ringo will post it, a statement. Um, I kind of doubt it because apparently he was not pleased with that, that George Martin right. you know, asked him to step aside. Yeah. So now as a segue, um, one of the interesting things about the one set is they sometimes in several cases use different audio for the video and the, and the CDs, depending what they were using as visuals. And as it turns out, the CD has the take of Love Me Do with Andy White, but the video is the video uh, has the audio of the single with Ringo um, 
playing drums. Mm-hmm. So actually in that wow. set, you get both versions. So that's actually a nice <laughs> touch. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, ironically Is enough, any... Tom brought that up to me the other day. Mm-hmm. Does anyone know why the decision was made that when the British single came out, it was the one with Ringo on it? If George Martin wasn't so, you know, pleased with Ringo's performance as a drummer, or he wasn't sure of him and his ability, why did they choose for the British single to be the one with Ringo on it? Uh, no one has ever gotten to the bottom of that so far as I know. Um, I, you oh. know, it's obviously something Mark Lewison's looked into, and I don't think he's been able to get a... a that's a decisive answer. Also, hmm. as you know, once once the Please Please Me album came out with the Andy White take on it, they ended up switching out the single, so later pressings of the British single were also Andy White. It was really just the earliest mm-hmm. pressings had mm-hmm. Ringo. Um, so it may have been a mistake. But, you know, they're both... I, I like both of those versions. It's It's not just that one has a tambourine and one doesn't. There's also a different kind of bass line. You know, in fact, it's easier for me to tell which is which because of the bass line. Um, because on the one with Ringo, uh, Paul does a, a slightly uh, uh, sort of a dotted rhythm almost. It's like, it's like just like boom, boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. And he leaves out the, uh-huh. you know, the, the extra note on the one with Andy White. Mm-hmm. It shows boom, boom, boom. So, um, so those are things you can listen for to determine which is which when you're hearing them. Of course, the tambourine does make a difference. The tambourine makes a difference, but right. you know the the acoustic guitars are sort of jangly too, so things sort of meld together mm-hmm. in a certain way. You can tell from the vocals too. Yeah, that's right. A little more nervous in the earlier one, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about. One in its various iterations, and one plus. I, I, I would say probably for you know for the sake of concision, we're probably going to be talking mostly about one plus, the version that has the CD and two DVDs or Blu-rays, because mm-hmm. that has the most stuff. Mm-hmm. Wait for Al's train to go. Yes, waiting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for the uh, the northern and southern line to get uh, get past the door here. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, shall we start with Al? Just for your general impressions about the the set. Yeah, um, it's 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 very well put together. Uh, um, just in general, the uh, certainly on the CD, uh, the the one CD, the the one CD, the remastered, remixed one CD. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the overall sound is much brighter. You know, the first three tracks, obviously, there's not much you can do with with that but you know other than you know the you know the whether or not from me to you should be in uh, in stereo yeah but uh the uh you know several of the uh of the tracks are just sound really outstanding i feel fine for instance sounds much better balanced than mm-hmm. i ever recall it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, and also i have a question on all you need is love Mm-hmm. Now that sounds about as good as any version of it I've ever heard. Uh, is that a new remix, or is that perhaps the version from that Giles Martin did for Love, or the version that was done for the Yellow Submarine soundtrack song track? I, it's a new version. Um, the ones you know, I, I compared some of the song track ones. I don't know if I compared that one. I compared some of the others, Yellow Submarine and Eleanor Rigby, for instance, and they're they're definitely different mixes. I think that mm-hmm. the Peter Cobbin, who mixed the song track one, was a little more adventurous, um, uh, whereas yeah. Giles Martin wanted to more or less reproduce what his father did. So, for instance, on Yellow Submarine, where the you know John comes in with the funny voices, and there are other voices you know captain captain that kind of thing uh, what what peter cobbin did mm-hmm. is he he spread those across the two speakers so you've you've got you know the, mm-hmm. the voices coming in different places giles martin did pretty much what his father did which was have them all on one side so anyway continue yeah. al if you, you i'm sure if, you there, if there was if there was anything uh, uh you know a shortcoming i was slightly disappointed that they didn't get a little more adventurous with those mixes yeah. i really thought that they would 
Yeah. Um, mm. Especially since they went yeah. to the point of telling everybody it was remixed. Yeah. Um, I expected some major, major, major changes. And, you know, there, especially with the CD, there wasn't. I mean, the DVD had, I think, some more changes. Although, I mean, there are some really nice tracks on the CD. Uh, you know, the middle tracks, Paperback Writer and those Yes, you know that sounds. I mean, mm -hmm. I Absolutely. I did AB comparisons on that in the days before it was released, before I wrote up my review, and I was completely blown away. It was it was. I mean, they sounded fantastic. They really did. Yeah, and and one thing that I've always felt, and absolutely, and this and and this album just confirms it for me, is that I want to hold your hand should never be heard in stereo. Hmm. It just I really mean, the power of that. Record, it just it uh, it should always be heard in mono. You know, breaking it up into stereo just really makes you know to to paraphrase you know John Lennon about the, the stereo version of Revolution. It turns it into ice cream. Huh. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't I don't necessarily I, agree with that, Al. I because I I like the the stereo version, but. Yeah, I like the stereo version too. I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I do agree with John's comments about Revolution. Revolution yeah. has a lot more guts and, and yeah. more balls to it in mono. You know, that's the way to listen to it. Mm -hmm. And Paperback and Writer maybe, did too, maybe, but but uh, but the remix sort of approximates a lot of the mono power that had been lost in the stereo Paperback Writer. Yes. So I think mm -hmm. they yes. fixed some things. Yeah, yeah. They did a wonderful job with that. Yeah. Uh, so, Ken, what about you? Um, overall, I'm totally blown away by mm -hmm. everything. But just talking about the CD alone, I was expecting something drastic. I thought there'd be some slight changes, and that's mm -hmm. pretty much what we've gotten here. When I read John Martin's comments about this, he pretty much said he was kind of striving for more of a mono sound while keeping it stereo. And I could see what he was saying there, especially with um, the difference in Paperback Rider and the intro. Mm -hmm. it, in the stereo, isn't uh, the vocals in one channel, but now it's centered in, in both. You know, there's more power that way yeah. in mm -hmm. the song. Yeah. So uh, I certainly think Paperback Rider has, has more guts to it, you know, more meat to it this way. Um, definitely feel more bass than drums, which is what I expected. When you're trying to make songs of the past, recordings of the past more contemporary, you have to beef up the drums a little bit. Mm -hmm. and the bass and i think that uh you can certainly sense that yeah in this collection you know i'm very pleased i've read your comments alan which has influenced the way that i've been thinking but i certainly um the first thing that leaped out at me was that i did hear more of the um piano in, in penny lane mm -hmm. in the in the quarter notes that are being played by paul in the song it's um i think you worded it the staccato you know yeah. uh mm -hmm. playing of of that, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more of the flute in the very beginning. But the thing is, whenever you're dealing with remixes, and I, I always like to hold off for a while before I make comments, because depending upon what system you're playing it in, you can hear something different in each system. Right. And the first time mm -hmm. that I listened to the CD, I listened in my headphones. I guarantee you when I play this uh, in my living room, in my stereo, I'll probably hear something different altogether. So, um, and the same thing if you play it in the car. There's all sorts of nuances that you'll pick up in certain songs that maybe you didn't hear the first time around. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't expecting anything drastic. I think if, if, there was, if there were drastic mixes, a lot of people would complain about it. Too many people. Right. Even the ones who are, who are more, more adventurous and more open-minded to it would still think, you know, you're going a little bit too far here. It's one thing when you're playing around with it, like with the soundtrack of Love. You know, that had a purpose. There are reasons why they mix songs together in that way. Right, and so people but, gave um, them leeway you know, because that was the, the deal, you know. Right, but these were really tastefully done. Yeah. You know, there's some slight changes, but not enough to make people cry out, oh, what have you done here? Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I, like, I like what was done. Yeah. I'm very pleased with the CD. You know, and, and you mentioned the, uh, the bass and the drums, and as 
we all know, I mean, the Beatles complained even during the Beatles era that they weren't getting the bass and drum sound that they wanted. And they would bring in R&B records from America to EMI and say, why can't you cut them like this? Mm. Um, so this is correcting what they always have said was a deficit. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but, you know, just in talking to people about um, about this release, a number of people have said, you know, now hearing these remixes, now I see the point of Ringo. You know, now I see why Ringo was regarded mm. as, you know, mm -hmm. by the rest of them as such a great drummer. And, and I think these have done Ringo really a service without turning it into a drum record with guitar backing, you know. Um, I think it's brought, brought mm -hmm. him and Paul uh, up in the mix to a, a much more sort of realistic place. So yeah, I mean, well, that's, that's what they said about the 2009 remasters. That's what that's what they were saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, everybody was pointing to the drumming. You could finally, finally hear Ringo's drumming. Yeah, and I always remember George Harrison talking about Rubber Soul in particular, and that Ringo's drums used to sound like tin cans. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you listen to the 2009 remasters, and you know, all of his drumming really shines. So um, yeah, he certainly benefits. As does Paul with these uh, remixes mm -hmm. and the remasters. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, your your general feeling? My general feeling. I'm 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 happy with the remixes. I think that, um, like I said, I kind of was expecting more. I was expecting they would go a little further, since uh, you know, kind of more on what they did with song track. Mm -hmm. But uh, the you know the upgrades on on. Um, say like paperback writer and rain and those things were just absolutely awesome i like i said i did some a b comparisons in the days before it came out on the street before i wrote my review and you know just hearing the just hearing those differences was just absolutely uh uplifting it was really 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 good i was really pleased yeah um you know if anything i wish they had made video mix uh, you know they had put some of the songs that weren't in the original 27 on cd um right. mm -hmm. as a like a bonus cd for the for the people who bought the deluxe um right. like Re real love and free as a bird i'm sorry that the only way that you're going to get mp3 mixes of those or i should say audio mixes of those now is from bootlegs because they didn't bother to do that and yeah. I think that was one thing they missed. You know, um, I mean, I think the, the video quality is, is tremendous. And I know there's been some grousing about that, especially with the Blu-rays. We were talking about this before we got started. And I'm sitting here while we're sitting here talking and doing this. I'm sitting here watching the Blu-ray, uh, my Blu-ray. And, you know, it looks fine. I mean, again, you know, thinking about these are, you know, all, in some cases over 50 years old. Mm -hmm. um, the quality was not made for, in many cases, for this kind of reproduction, you know, of, of being upgraded and, you know, being archived this way 50 years later. Right. Um, one, one big exception to that rule, and I wrote about this before the release came out, was eight days a week. That oh, looks, gosh. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That looks... So damn do you good. think do you think they're just teasing us with that about yeah. you know yes we have Shea <laughs> Stadium and it looks like this and you can't absolutely, have it yet absolutely. until we yeah. say <laughs> yeah right. it does and look absolutely. beautiful and the other thing that looks good is um, the within you without you mm. that looked crystal clear on the Blu-ray and mm -hmm. I couldn't I couldn't believe I mean I don't have there I mean we don't have Blu-rays of the of the love stuff yet mm -hmm. um, but. I mean, that looked so good. You know, what I remember that was another upgrade. And the and the Let It Be stuff looks really good, too. And I've got, as we all do, you know, how many versions of of the movie. And I did mm -hmm. a side-by-side -side comparison of that. And the Let It Be clips look great. I mean, they don't look perfect. I, I don't think the graininess is ever going to go away, unfortunately, on that. Um, even though... You know, we'd all love it to, but I mean, it looks it looks really good. Um, you do. know, it looks really the clip the Let It Be clips in this look sharper than mm -hmm. I think we've ever seen them. Yeah. Um, and, even the you know even the bootlegs they even said were fantastic. 
look great. I'm looking right now at the animated menus. I think that's one thing that kind of ticked me off a little bit was the animated menus because they took they took so much time, even though they don't take that much time. But after watching them for several days and looking at the, you know, how funny they were in the Hey Jules with the yeah. Hey Jude, yeah. um, I actually yeah. appreciated that a little more. Mm. Um, so I'm not so not complaining too much about that. But I mean, overall, this is fantastic. I mean, you know, I was, you know, I I don't mean to put myself out there, but I mean, I this was one thing that I'd been talking and asking for for years and now that it's here i'm i'm really really glad and you know for whatever shortcomings you know it's not exactly the way i would have done it but i'm not going to complain i'm really yeah. not you know there are a couple of anomalies maybe we should mention um first of all the uh you know the the video discs have 5.1 surround sound and the mixes are different. I mean, obviously by definition, they're going to be different, but for instance, in one case, a day in the life in surround sound, it is a remix of a day in the life as we know it. But in stereo, it is the love mix of a day in the life, which is one of the more straightforward mixes on love, except that they remove Mm -hmm. the second piano part. Um, mm. And it's most telling in the build-up to when the vocal comes in, because the last piano chord before the vocal starts is not in the piano part that they left there, but is in the one that they didn't include. Um, and that strikes me as perhaps a mistake. You know, uh, I don't know whether they were just trying to save the effort of um, remixing again, because they had just done a remix for for the love album and maybe they thought that it was more straightforward than it actually was but whatever the reason that's uh that's an oddity another thing on the cd eight days a week there actually is a kind of editing mistake there doesn't bother me particularly but it's just sort of interesting eight days a week was basically take 13 except at the end the percussion got a little bit out of sync and the guitars were a little bit out of tune and so they made an edit piece which was take 15 and they edited the edit piece on just as the outro of the song. Giles appears to have overlooked that or or forgotten or missed it or something but he didn't add add on the take 15 edit piece. So the good news is that we now have take 13 complete which we didn't have before. And the bad news is if you want it to be the exact, you know, a remix of the exact song as we had it, um, well, it's missing the Take 15 edit piece. I would say that nine and three quarters out of ten people won't even notice it. Um, right. But, <laughs> but you know, In, it's just... Including us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a reason not to throw away your 2009 remaster. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, the the slight attitudinous in the guitars doesn't really bother me. I know a couple of people it does bother, and and uh, there's so much going on there to say that the percussion's out of sync is okay, you know, maybe. But George Martin and the Beatles must have heard it at the time, or they wouldn't have done the edit, but... Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I I thought the record sounded great, and um, I'm actually just as happy to have a full take that we didn't previously have. But, you know, it's just one of these things that, like, a project like this is always going to yield some extra stuff that is perhaps unplanned, and that's one... I, and you don't, don't forget the real love change. Oh yes, the real love um, change. Well, we've had a, gro- a long debate uh-huh. about this, partly because we were talking about different mm-hmm. things. I, I thought you were talking about the right. solo being different, mm-hmm. which sounds the same to me. But a lot of the little bits of George's mm-hmm. guitar are different, and I think there is in "Free as a Bird" as well. There's a section where his vocals different. You know, where in one. He says the yes. life that we once knew, and the other he says the mm-hmm. love that we once knew. So you've got some, right. you got some changes there oh. too. And as you said, mm-hmm. there should be a CD I'm version like... of that, you know, but uh, right. but there isn't. <laughs> yeah. Why would they do that? Why would they let it go out that way? As I, soon as know... I watched the Freeze Bird video, I noticed that instantly. George's yeah. vocal is different. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's the same. It's the same logic that was used in the changes in the anthology 
that drove everybody nuts. Um, you know, and I, I, I mean, the only thing I can pin it down to, and Alan, tell me if you think this is correct, is it's their music and they can do what they want with it. You know, sure. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that's yeah. what. Uh, I mean, I know the yes, it is. You know what they did with yes, it is on uh, on anthology just knocked me. You know, I really was not in favor of that at all. I did, really mm-hmm. didn't like it. Um, splicing mean, all those cross fading into cross well, fading into the mm-hmm. release version. You mean? Or well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Doing that instead of just using the whole outtake that we'd had, you know, that had been floating around. I mean, why do something like that? You know? Yeah. So you know, but at the same time, you know, it's nice to have these little changes. Mm-hmm. It gives us something to you know to add to the to the you know to the the canon. You know, to say you know, that's right. We've got, look at we've got here. You know, so. Not only that, but in real love, at the very beginning, John's vocals are more processed, but kind yes. of buried more than mm-hmm. on the record. Yeah. So I noticed mm-hmm. that instantly. Mm-hmm. What's well, really about those two, about real love and free as a bird, is that you know if you look at it from the fact that it was an artificial, it was an artificial record to begin with, and we have outtakes that we've never heard before stuck in there now even as small as they are you know they've created their own little you know alternate version you know and i think that's actually Mm -hmm. you know a good that's a good thing Mm -hmm. but i'll tell you and ken will ken will acknowledge this i called him the night i had the i got the disc and i was sitting there watching it and i was literally almost my voice was almost shaking because i couldn't believe they'd Mm. actually made changes in these songs Mm. you know and it so yeah. it was it was amazing, but I'm not gonna you know it's it's not. I know there are people that will say why did they bother? Why did they change it? Why did they change it? I think you know the more the more the merrier as far as you know we have the original versions. The, the the thing is though that with the 2009 remaster, they've said that the new one is replacing the old one. So you know don't let if you don't have them don't let them go. If you haven't got them go out and get them if that really matters to you. Well, they probably I have a feeling that it's certainly in the case of Free as a Bird and Real Love since they're not technically, I mean, obviously all four Beatles are on it but, you know, they're not technically Beatles recordings. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're not part of the canon, so to speak. So, it's probably <laughs> What was that? <laughs> uh, I think I somebody's phone yes. I think, I, think John, that's the phone. I think John and George, John and George, are responding to you on that comment. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, really, you you could argue that there is much of the Beatles canon as I me mine is that John didn't turn up oh, to sure. to record. So yeah. yeah, here they at least yeah, had a no, recording I, of him. I, I, I totally disagree with that. I think it's definitely very much a part of the Beatles canon. Oh yeah. There's yeah. so many songs in the, that the Beatles released that only had one, two, or three Beatles in them. Well, you know? in this, in this right. Case, so I'm talking about the, you know, the the 1962 to 1969, you know, the EMI, mm-hmm. you know, canon, right. you right. know, okay. not 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 the Deco audition tapes, not the Tony Sheridan sessions, mm. not Free as Bird and Real Love. I'm talking about the, you know, mm. the 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 actual EMI canon. Right. They're not part of that, so there's probably less sensitivity about messing not messing, but, you know, making changes in those two songs, then there might be making changes in the, you know, things that are in, within the canon itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, should we clarify um, for people the argument in uh, on behalf of remixes in any case because of the the original recording process and what remixing allows. Uh-huh. I think, you know, as, as uh, probably everyone who listens to this read Mark Lewison's recording sessions book. And as you know, sure. most of the time that they recorded, they were using four track and four track very quickly got to be way too few tracks for them. And so their solution was to do what they called reduction mixes, which was copying the tape to another four track tape mixing a few of the tracks together as they went along. So every time they did that, 
you got even on really good equipment like they were using, you got some generation loss, which means very subtle distortions and dulling of the instrumental and vocal textures, a little bit of tape hiss added, stuff like that. Now, some of these tracks, you know, something like Penny Lane, you know, had several reduction mixes along the way. And then at the end, you have a four-track tape with everything on it they want on it, and you make a mono and stereo master, which is yet another copy. So for a lot of these recordings, you know, by the time we got it, it was, you know, maybe fourth, fifth, sixth generation, depending, you know, because in addition, mm -hmm. once they had the master, you know, it's not like EMI sent the actual master to every country to be cut. You know, they made a copy of the master too. So you're down right. yet another generation. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, EMI went back to its archive and got the session tapes, and they transferred everything digitally, including the tapes as they were before the reduction mixes were made. And that means, in effect, they have a first-generation copy of every single instrumental line that they can use for these mixes instead of the third, fourth, or fifth generation that we that we got. Plus, it allows for some flexibility. I mean, you know, you're making your first reduction mix and you say combine a, a couple of vocal tracks and a guitar track and, um, you know, and a piano. When you get a couple of stages away, you might very well say, uh, well, you know, I, I wish the piano was a little bit louder. I wish the vocals could be put on alternate channels. It, it's too late. It's the reduction mix. Everything's been recorded around it. You can't change mm -hmm. it. But now you can, you know. Now they have both quality and flexibility that they didn't have available to them in the 1960s. And so, right. you know, just with that in mind, and even if you're going to do it as, as conservatively as Giles Martin did, just for that, I would love to hear remixes of the entire catalog. You know, just for the Me generation loss, you know, issue, because it's mm. more like you're in the room with the Beatles. You're hearing the sounds as they were recorded. And that's why also the bass and drums sound so good, you know. So if they ever get around to doing the Blu-ray thing that they've been that we've been hearing that they'll do, you know, maybe that will, you know, maybe that will all come about. Um, yeah. I mean, that's what that was the that was the selling point with the remasters. And as good as. I mean, masters were, you know, there's still further they can they can go further. Um, yeah, because with the remasters, you're still dealing with the reduction mixes and all that stuff that happened. You're you're mm -hmm. you're saving maybe a generation or so, but you're not saving that much. No. No. And so, this also mm -hmm. explains why, when you're getting into more complicated pieces of work, the more layered pieces of work like what was on Sgt. Pepper, I think the music suffers because of the reduction mixes because there probably were plenty of them. Mm -hmm. And if you listen with your headphones, you can hear a lot more hits, and it's a duller sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got better with the 2009 remasters, no doubt about it, but you can certainly tell the difference between simpler productions that required less tracks, you know, and, um, you know, th those recordings can tend to be brighter and punchier. Mm -hmm. For that reason, mm -hmm. but obviously, if, if you go back to the original masters, then the sky's the limit. That opens up the doors to enormous possibilities. Yeah. So sure. yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Alan, I've got a question for you. A uh, uh, kind of an audio question for from somebody who, you know, obviously over the years we've all done a fair amount of bootleg collecting. Mm -hmm. So I'm we just have? curious about we have. <laughs> Well, some, some of us have. Theoretically. <laughs> theoretically. Right, theoretically, yes. Maybe not in reality. On, uh, on Can't Buy Me Love, you know, those of us who've had copies of Around the Beatles um, and have, had, have, you know, heard and seen that performance of Can't Buy Me Love, mm -hmm. the crowd is almost overwhelming, mm -hmm. you know, in the audio mix. Here, on this, on this clip... The, there's almost no crowd. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if perhaps they used something that we've had on bootlegs for a number of years, the actual studio recordings that were done before the show. 
Um, I think so. I know they have those, and I know that they have, you know, the real I ones. Um, when I say the real ones, I mean not the bootlegs, and I can tell you why I know that. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> once when I was on a, a trip to England um, before the anthology came out while it was in the works, um, I was visiting Mark, and he said, uh, could you bring the disc of that has that, you know, pre-audience around the Beatles track? And I said, um, yeah, sure, but why? And he said, well, they don't actually have it. Um, so... I brought it over. He called EMI. They sent a messenger on a motorbike and got the disc, copied it, and brought it back. And then I don't know how far after that it was, but he said, you know what? They don't actually need it because they've located the original tapes of of that session. So um, hmm. so they have the, the upgraded thing. I think there were a couple of tracks. Well, Shout, at least, was on the anthology. Right. Um Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's very, it's very likely that he used the, um, the, the pre-audience tape in making his, um, his mix for the surround, for the video. Mm -hmm. I kind of wondered why, you know, it seemed to me, especially if you're going to be making remixes in 5.1, for Hard Day's Night and Can't Buy Me Love, I almost kind of wish that they did what they did with the Yellow Submarine stuff, used some footage from the film, but given us a remix mm -hmm. of the studio recordings. Because yes, it's great to see that live Hard Day's Night from Paris, but I think they should just release the whole Paris on its own and, and give it to mm -hmm. us that way, yeah. uh, rather than a track at a time. And, and the same with Around the Beatles. They should put that out with you know, or, or maybe a remix soundtrack or not, but but whatever. Um, oh. So I kind of wish that that they had used the studio recordings of those tracks, you know, perhaps with footage from the film um, to make you know, even if it was making new videos. But uh, that would that's just my sense. Am I the only one here with surround with five point one? Yes, I think you are. So mm -hmm. yeah. then I'll just comment a little on that. In a certain yeah. way, I found that, you know, I mean, it was great to hear. It's great to be enveloped in the sound. And some of them, like A Day in the Life and Strawberry Fields, you really feel like you're in the middle of it all. But for the most part, the surround mixes pretty much just put ambient sound in the rear speakers. Um, and Giles Martin talked about this, and I think that that's also a bit of the sort of conservative approach of not wanting to change too much. You know, I, I think a lot of us were sort of hoping that the 5.1 sound would be five discrete channels of sound for, among other reasons, it makes it possible to sort of take that sound apart and and get again closer to the the multi tracks but i think mm. uh, you know there are there are two philosophy at least two philosophies of mixing 5.1 one is using the five speakers and creating effects all around you and the other is using it to you know as as giles martin talked about in his bbc interview the beatles are in front of you on stage you don't want the lead guitar coming out of the rear left channel the problem is a lot of these are studio recordings, so it's not the Beatles on stage. And, and I, I'd have loved to feel like I was sitting in the middle of Abbey Road with the lead guitar coming out of the left rear channel. You know, that would have been mm -hmm. kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, maybe at some point he'll make that kind of mix. He talked about how if he were mix remixing the White Album, he would uh, go a little wilder. So, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, people have now ripped the five channels out of the Blu-ray soundtrack. And if you listen to the rear channels, there's not a lot there but ambience. Having said that, there are, the three front channels are often pretty different. And Real Love is a good example. The center channel, for instance, in the intro, you just hear the single line piano. You don't hear the harpsichord. You don't hear any. You, you mm. hear some other backing, but you, what you hear for a melody is just that one piano line. Um, and so the two stereo channels in front are different uh, kind of things. And if you listen to the rear channel, 
they didn't put George's, you know, little guitar fills between lines in the rear at all. Those are just coming out of the front. So you do have some difference, but I think it's not as as um, as varied as a lot of people hoped. Hmm. Sounds good. You know, I, I, I've I've really enjoyed putting it on in surround and sitting in the middle of the room and feeling, you know, enveloped by it. But um, I think people wanted it to be a bit more discreet sound. So oh. that's the oh, five point one commentary here. So would you <laughs> have, would you say the love the love five point one is better than than this basically, Alan? Um, you mean of the documentary? No, no, no. The on the on the love DVD, the five one there. Um, hmm. Which five point one? Well, it, 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 didn't they? They did five one on on love, did they? On, on the CD, on the, on the on on the DVD, didn't they? Um, the DVD is just a documentary about the love. Thing, no, 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 right? no. When they when they did the dual. And they did the dual release with the with the CD and the DVD. You know, it's interesting. I um, probably didn't have yeah. five point one at the time and have neglected to take it off the shelf again. So Aha. I need to do that. Yes, I you need do. to do that. Yes, I, I'm do. sure it's got much more going on because that was yeah, the kind of mix re- it was. You know, the, the comments I remember hearing at the time was the five one on the love on the love DVD was fantastic. Oh. Yes. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of those things that I bought, even though I didn't have the equipment, and then I got the equipment <laughs> and forgot about it. <laughs> Whoops. Mm-hmm. Well, good. There's some yeah, more no, beetling to be I, done this weekend. <laughs> there we go. The documentary doesn't have, any, as far as I know, doesn't have anything. Uh, as far as I know, the doc. I mean, if it does, it's really irrelevant because it's all talking anyway, yeah. for the most part. Although there is there is the audio parts to it too, but right. Um, yeah, you definitely should pull out that DVD and take a look at it. Oh yes. So. Okay. Because hmm. I remember that all being extracted too. Um, I remember seeing extractions of all of that stuff too. Um, right. So. Huh. Right. There we go. But they've already extracted the uh, the new stuff, eh? Hey? Yeah. Or I shouldn't I shouldn't say that. I guess we shouldn't say that too loud. <laughs> Well, I, I have a feeling at this point Apple mud must have known that people would do it. Uh, maybe that's why they made the 5.1 mixes the way they did, too. Well, actually, um, you know, what was interesting and was the lack of complete previews beforehand. I mean, there were people commenting about iTunes, people, you know, saying, you know, although there were the, the videos, I mean, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that they did not put out beforehand. They kept everybody in suspense, basically. Yeah. So that when release day came, it wouldn't all be, uh, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't all be out there, and um, and it worked. It worked. I think it worked very well. What yeah. They did and it's interesting that they did all the video previews that they did because it, uh, even though I, I did hear comments, especially near the end, you know, if they keep doing this, I'm not going to have to buy it. But I'll tell you, I mean, there was a lot of enthusiasm <laughs> as you as witnessed by. You know the stuff going on in Japan, and you know, and and even in America. I mean, there was, yeah. you know, there was quite a lot of enthusiasm. You know, they made it very exciting. They made it an exciting release um, mm-hmm. you know, that people were waiting for mm-hmm. and wanted, and it, totally the opposite of the one release in two thousand. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, I bought many copies of it to give to people, but. You know, it wasn't that exciting mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, those of us who have everything many times over. And here, even though we had it many times over, there was something new, you know, the remixes, the video. Even those of us who had the video, we never had it like this, you know. Um, mm, exactly. And, uh, yeah, they made it an event, and that was a, a good thing. And yet, from what I hear, they underestimated the market for it. Um, I heard from someone at a retail store that shortly before it came out, they got a call from Universal saying, listen, you ordered, you know, X number of discs and we can't, we just can't really supply that. We're, we're short. And the, the mm-hmm. person said, you know, wait a minute, you, you don't understand. People have pre-ordered these. We've promised them for 
release day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Universal managed to come up with the numbers that they needed, and they were okay. But, you know, it, it just sort of surprised me. It's like, wait a minute, it's a Beatles release. It's stuff mm-hmm. that are hasn't you, are been Are you referring out. to Amazon? You're no, referring to Amazon? no, I'm not. Because I heard a lot, of, a lot of people who ordered on Amazon in Australia right. and even in America – yeah, um, I wouldn't say a, a, a lot here, but I, I did hear a lot of uh, a lot of reports from Australia that yeah. people who ordered pre-ordered uh, for, through Amazon there did right. not get it. Yeah, I heard that too, but but no, this was from someplace else, and uh, okay, you know, it just surprises me that you know, wait a minute, you're a record company, you're putting out Beatles stuff that hasn't been out, and it doesn't occur to you that you need to have a lot of them on hand, you know? <laughs> what is that? Yeah, I mean the visual. The visual thing, you know, has a has a built-in, um, I don't know how to say, it, attraction, I guess, because of the MTV, you know, situation. And, mm-hmm. I mean, that kind of, even though MTV isn't where it is now, I mean, is where it was. Um, I mean, there's still people love vid- visuals, and this stuff, a lot of the general public has not seen. We right. have, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. we've yeah. seen it zillions of times over and in lousy quality and let's face it the beatles were very visual guys you know there's a lot Mm -hmm. you you get from looking at the interplay between them and even just the chemistry of the group you know i I mean i've seen these things Mm -hmm. a gazillion times and yet sat there saying you know it's interesting how even really early on Paul was always on. He was the one smiling at the yes. audience. John, not particularly. Mm-hmm. George, a bit less. You know, and and just looking at the the differences between there's just so much to watch with the Beatles always. You know, mm-hmm. and then and then when they throw in stuff like oh let's do hello goodbye in our Sergeant Pepper suits. I mean that's that's an incredibly visual <laughs> clip. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So in a day yeah. in the life, the, the the sessions, you know, it's cut very weirdly because it's sort of psychedelic and it's jumping around, and yet mm-hmm. you're seeing the orchestra with its funny noses and masks on. You're seeing McCartney conducting it a little. You're seeing George Martin conduct it. You know, you're you're getting an awful lot of information from these visuals. So mm-hmm. yeah, incredible yeah. production. It's always fascinating. It's fascinating to always watch John and Paul, mm-hmm. and how much Paul cracks up because of John. Yes, in some mm-hmm. of these absolutely. Yeah, uh, um, we can work uh, it out just to see. Yes. Paul. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And uh, you know, you're wondering what's going on during those videos, but uh, yeah. there are times <laughs> when Paul is trying to to contain himself. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, he's smiling, and something's going on in his mind that John's. You know. He's playing with them in some way, and then you're trying to figure it out. And at some point, you know, Paul cracks up or something. But yeah, that's that's the great thing. Like you said, visually, there's so much interplay going on with them. And, yeah. um, you know, in, in many ways, we have to be very grateful that at the end of 1965, the Beatles cut 10 videos in one day. And most of those yeah. videos were pretty simple. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, but they're still fun to watch. And then once you get mm-hmm. into the more artsy uh, videos, visually, they are just stunning. And they're in, in the best quality I've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, just going yeah. into uh, Paperback Rider and Rain, the ones from Rain, my God. Yeah. I mean, I, I love yeah. the, the fact that they put the three videos of Rain in there. And I like the third one, the black and white one, just as much as the other two. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. kind of very artsy being black and white. Yeah. And the fact that that was more of a performance video than the other two were. And then once you get into Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane, again, very artsy videos. And then you go into Hey Jude and Revolution, which looks stunning. Yeah. I mean, such yes. a clear picture as I've never seen before. Yeah. And then, you know, this, you know, apart from all that, there's some emotion tied in since we're all human here. Every time I watch sure. the something video... You know, I, I have to obviously acknowledge the fact that there's eight people in that video and half of them yeah. are no longer here. Yeah. You yeah, know, exactly. and uh, it's it's a very personal video to see each of the four uh-huh. Beatles with their women at the time, their wives at the time. Mm-hmm. So watching that really moves me. But um, there's a couple of questions that I'd like to pose to you guys because I've watched all the videos and I listened to the CD. The only thing I haven't had time to do is to read the booklet. But maybe you can answer a few questions, which is, 
of the of the live performances that they chose, they're all great. Yeah. But do you know what the process was behind those? Because obviously there's got to be several uh, videos uh, of from me to you. I mean, why pick the ro- the Royal Variety performance one of that? You know, can't buy me love. Why? Why the one from around the Beatles? You know, there must have been some thought process behind that. And the other question that I have is that for for the songs for which they made more than one video, how do you pick which is the best one to put on the first disc? Hmm. You know, it was it always the first video that they made? Because I love I love that video of Hello Goodbye where they're all dancing around. Right. <laughs> you know, and you see nah. Paul, you know, together, arm in arm there, dancing. You know, right. I like that one just as much. Yeah, um, like all of those. Why is the first the, yeah, well, they're, they're, probably they're a lot of fun to watch. The, the the two videos, the two videos of Hey Jude are wonderful. I love the the second one just as much as the first. Yeah, I think in in some of those cases they went with what was widely seen at the time. So Hello Goodbye, the Pepper one was seen on on Ed Sullivan. Right, and right. Um, you know, I don't know if it, 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 this is in the, one of the things you may discover in the booklet, but those. Uh, videos um paul mccartney is listed as the director for them right um however something was apparently directed by neil aspinall and it just says directed by the beatles so Mm -hmm. a funny thing about something as well is that um you know those were all obviously filmed separately there's no scene in there where two beatles are in the same frame right yeah, right. and that's in fact you mentioned Ken, you mentioned the you know the sort of the emotion of knowing that half of those people are gone now, but also you know right. just the historical the historical standpoint of you know knowing that that video was you know the necessity of making that video was the, the fact that for all intents and purposes the group didn't exist right. by that point. Right. Yeah, you know, mm. and uh, and um, uh, you mentioned from me to you. I have a feeling. I'm, I was trying to. I'm sort of doing a quick inventory in my mind. It's very possible that that version from the Rail Command performance may be the only video version of that song that exists now. Didn't they do it in Washington? Yeah, they did. Uh, uh, yes, they did. Yes, yes. But there aren't but, you many. Know, the you're one, right. You're, there, there are very few. The one. Yeah. Tr- the one choice that I was surprised was they, they uh, with yesterday they used the Ed Sullivan version instead of the Blackpool, uh, and now yeah. um, opportunity knocks. That yeah. would have been yeah. fun to use. Why didn't they use that one? That was so well. Cute. He's yeah, except that he's he Paul is obviously very nervous mm-hmm. in the, in that one. You True. can tell. Uh, True. So. I guess they feel that the you know that the Sullivan performance is a more polished one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could and be. Also, in the in the paperback writer uh, rain videos, Paul's tooth, you know, is very right. uh, oh, yeah. noticeable in, in all of those. And I asked uh, Michael Lindsay Hogg. I said, "Did you guys talk about that, or, or was there any discussion?" And he said, "You know, he said no. Uh, you know, they just did it." And the other thing I asked him was about the Shuby Doo vocals on revolution i said did they tell you about that he said no no no. that was just a nice surprise mm-hmm. so it was completely improvisational he didn't say we have sorry, just met mr campbell <laughs> sorry yeah. little paul is dead thing going on you know yeah i, I, ah, I see i see that cute. i yeah. got it mm. I was just going to say that, you know, when you watch Revolution right now, the video, it is just got, it's so, it, it's, it's such a heavy record, the yeah, video it's version. Killer. It's it's, killer. it's great. And the first thing I noticed when they leaked the video online was how much the drums were beefed up, Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. you know, especially early on. And my God, they're rocking on that version. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to like that version better than the the studio one that we've come to know all all these years. Mm. But uh, it's it's so great. And um, yeah, another thing I wanted to mention was um, it's a nice surprise that they included the, the introduction for um, Paperback Rider and Rain that was given to uh, Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan, right yeah. in there. Mm-hmm. And the David Frost, and, uh, the David Frost. Uh, oh, intro, too. sure. That was yeah. that was cool yeah. too. I like that. 
And of course, with the Sullivan intro to Paperback Writer, um, you see Paul holding up the negatives for the um, the butcher cover. Butcher cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Matter of fact, uh, on Hey Jude, uh, I have another no- another question for you, Alan. On the five point one mix of the video, mm. now on the you know the regular the regular sound, um, it sounds as if because you know we, we've always known that um, basically Paul was singing over the record, including his own vocal. Right. Through through most of that of that performance, and yet on the on the, you know these versions, especially the one on the first disc, at least on the verses, the the record vocal is not there. Hmm. You know he's not sing, he's not singing harmony basically with his own voice. Mm-hmm. Although on the choruses he is. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I don't know I, what I, I don't know what they used really. Um, yeah. What do you guys think of the commentaries? Not much. I, I, I think really? I think they phoned them in, and uh, you know there were are a couple yeah. of little interesting tidbits, um, but other uh, you know a lot of it was well okay you know here we are walking, mm-hmm. and you know and then we we get on horses and uh, okay they corroborate ring, the Ringo horse runaway story. Um, you know, Ringo's comment about the drum size changing in Hello Goodbye is kind of interesting, but, um, and Paul's uh, commentary about the strange guy in the Hey Jude video, at least, so now we know who he is and why he was there. But beyond mm-hmm. that, I, I, there wasn't a lot of information. They were basically telling us w- what we could see by just watching it. Right. I thought, I thought Paul, the Paul commentaries were better than Ringo's. I think, yeah, Ringo's really were just kind of, you know, window dressing, uh, mm. basically. And, and Paul's, Paul actually, you know, like you say, he said some stuff that actually was interesting. And and um, even even if the observations were what they were, at least, you know, Paul, there was enough of what Paul had to say that you could kind of gather some, I don't know, some feelings about, you know, what he was, you know, how, how he felt about them, where... Ringo didn't say a whole lot about anything, you know. I, yeah, but you know, know some of Ringo's were 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 a little funny, you know, funny asides like, okay, mm-hmm. we're going to get another wear out of those Sergeant Pepper costumes, you know, and it, mm-hmm. it, 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 it <laughs> caught a bit of his sense of humor, I, I thought. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, the commentaries. I mean, I, I don't imagine I'll really watch those again. To any of you, apart from the one time you watch them, is is there any reason to go back? No, I I wish they had done actually a few more. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, and and taking it more seriously, maybe you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I found the the bit about Strawberry Fields to be interesting because Paul was talking about how the Beatles at the time liked Swedish films, right? That's and true. very artsy films, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, you know Peter Goldman, mm-hmm. I guess uh, mm-hmm. that's the name of the director for Strawberry Fields. He. Um, you know, he led them in that direction into making something very artsy, and he had very definite ideas right. of what he wanted the band to do, and it was all done in one day. And you know, they, they do talk a little bit in detail uh, about that, mainly Paul. Mm-hmm. But uh, I found that to be interesting. I never knew that before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Ringo said that it was Paul's idea that he would jump up to the tree. You know, but then Paul said the director told him to do it, so he was, there was some contradiction going on too. So. <laughs> memories, memories like fade. Yeah. Right. I just think also, you know, um, just watching a lot of things. I mean, as you're watching, I mean, we were talking before about the interaction between them, but you think of other things too. Just as you see these clips, like the fact that when they did the yesterday performance on Ed Sullivan. Nobody in America would have even known yesterday at the time, you know. It had come out mm-hmm. on the British Help album. Yeah. It wasn't out as a single yet, and it, I don't think by the time it was even broadcast, perhaps, but it maybe had come out. Uh, that was the day but, before. Yeah, mm-hmm. but the studio audience must have had no idea what what that was all about, uh, and that must have been great, you know, sitting there and hearing live mm-hmm. a Beatles song you've never heard before, and it and it's mm-hmm. yesterday, you know. Just an incredible thing. You yeah. know, we, we've talked about that before because there have been several instances of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, recently when Dave Schwenson was 
was a guest on our show, and he brought up the fact that when the Beatles played at Shea, they did act naturally, mm-hmm. which hadn't been released here yet. That's right. right. Um, mm-hmm. Same thing with the, the Washington Coliseum show. Mm-hmm. Um, with Roll Over Beethoven mm-hmm. uh, being the first song, and... Um, and Long Tall Sally. And Long Tall Sally. Thank you, Al. Yeah. You right. know, yeah. so that certainly wasn't the first time that happened. That's right. So yeah. Beatles were full of surprises for us. That's right. One, yeah. one, one thing about the, uh, uh, Alan, you were talking about the interaction. It's fun just to watch, to focus in on each of them, you know, um, yeah. not their interaction, but just what they do. Um, I'm watching Hello Goodbye right now and, you know, watching them all kind of uh, play around. Ringo shaking his head. Mm-hmm. You know, it look, actually, he actually looks like he's a little tired, but I love the part at the end where the girls are dancing with John and John kind of leers over at the camera <laughs> mm-hmm. with this kind of, this, you know, snarky smile on his face like, ha ha, look at me. Don't you wish you were here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's that moment in, uh, in Hey Jude, uh, I think the version that's on the first disc where you can tell. Uh, Paul keeps glancing over at John and you can tell that he's either making faces or doing something. And finally, at one point, uh, almost near the, you know, the, the end of, you know, the first part of the song, Paul has to sort of just lower his head <laughs> to keep yeah. him cracking up entirely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it's, and mm. the funny thing is that if you think, you know, there's been all the talk all these years about, the uh, you know the white album being the tension you know the beginning of all the tensions and yet right in the middle of those sessions you have a moment like that mm-hmm. right you know which shows that they were still they were still that you know that bond right uh, that interact oh yeah but they were also they were also four very individual personalities and and absolutely we, and, yeah. and 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 they their personalities. I mean, that was what everybody fell in love with. And, and you can see that really to the nth degree on these videos, why, you know, individually, mm-hmm. why, you know, why everybody loved John, why everybody loved George, mm-hmm. you know, Ringo's, Ringo's, uh, uh, you know, this, you know, humor and, and Paul, of course, uh, uh, I like what you said, Alan, about Paul being on all the time. That's extremely true. Extremely true. Yeah. So. So, guys, we can be talking about this all night, and, um, you know, there's just so much material here, uh, but I think the bottom line is I think we all think this is a great release. We, we may have feelings about this or that flaw, but, um, you know, good work, Apple. And uh, so for this week, uh, that is Things We Said Today. If you want to email us, um, write to us at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. And you can find us on Twitter at the at symbol things we said fab. And uh, otherwise, we will see you next week. So for Ken Michaels, Steve Marinucci, and Al Sussman, I'm Alan Cozen, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>